What's going on everyone? This is Benjamin Dixon reporting for Your Black World and I wanted to share with you the interview uh, that I had with Josh Leves this morning, author of All In, discussing fatherhood in general. We discussed his chapter on black fatherhood, which really dispels everything that we've been told about black fatherhood throughout our lives. Listen in. Let's shift gears really hard because I'm, I I contacted you because of, of one particular chapter, and, and I'm glad I did because I enjoyed the entire book. Tell me what you found about black fatherhood based on some of these the, the statistics, excuse me, yeah. uh, from the CDC and a couple of key articles that you read. Right. One of the chapters in here is about how black – it's called How Black Fathers Are Doing Best of All, But There's Still a Crisis. So the dominant image of black fathers in America is wrong. The, dom the image, the idea that most black fathers are not there, that they're not present, that they're not home with their kids, is just – it's factually false. Right. So what I did in this book is I went to the hardest and best statistics that exist. I worked with the, the census. I worked with the CDC. And the lead researcher at the CDC on this says in my book, she says that the statistics that I'm reporting here, Mark, this is her quote, the end of the myth of the absent black father. It's so important for people to understand that by far the majority of black fathers live with their children, take care of their children, and, you know, in general, dads in America who are working, we spend an average of three hours a day with our kids. We, we bathe and clothe them and, and feed them and take care of them in numerous ways. And within that, black dads are actually doing the best of all. Black dads, on average, spend the most time doing those things with their kids throughout the week. So the, the good side of what I'm able to report there, and this is important that America understand this, is that by far, and you've talked about this, you know, you said, I'm a, I'm a good dad, committed dad, but that doesn't make me an exception. That makes me the rule. That's exactly right. In general, black dads are doing a great job, and we should all understand that. Absolutely. And you know what? I knew it intuitively. Uh, I mean, just from anecdotal information and um, observing everyone in my circle, there is not a single uh, black father that I know of and that I have encountered that is not actively engaged in their um, in their children's lives. So um, whenever people, and I think you mentioned this also with Tanisha Coates, um, how he mentioned where he gets too much praise for things that is quite normal, and that that really becomes an insult. Like this is just what we do. Um, yeah. What are some of the other things, the most interesting conundrums? Um, and actually, let me point to something in particular. You said that um, black fathers are doing the best, but there's still a crisis, yeah. un crisis portion. Right. Okay. So, so, and this is where things get really tricky because what happens is a lot of statistics get taken out of context. So, what I'm able to tell you is that by far most black dads live with their kids. But here's the negative side. And I know it sounds confusing, so we'll unpack this. Most black kids don't live with their dads. Now, here's how that happens, okay? Most black fathers have two or three kids, maybe, and live with their children. There are also black dads. There are dads of every race out there who, who are what I call serial impregnators, who, who go around having lots of babies by lots of women. And it's a particularly big problem in the black community. So there are... Some of these guys out there who are a minority, but they're off having six, seven, eight kids. And I have a guy in the book, a chapter from a man who was like that, eight kids by three women, who then turned his life around and finally realized he should be raising his kids and develop relationships with them. Two of them made it to the NFL, and he's close with them now. So we, we talk about this problem. So, so the, the first thing to understand is that it's a minority of dads who are like that. But there's just barely, barely more than half, just, just slightly over half the kids in this country who are black don't live with their fathers. But one more thing on this point, so important to understand. Not living with your father does not mean you're fatherless, right? So, so we hear statistics in general about fatherlessness, and these statistics are wrong. All the statistics that you've heard in America, all races, about fatherlessness are wrong. Because people take uh, someone's address. Let's say that my wife and I get divorced, and my kids, their primary address is with my wife, but I'm still with them every day. Some people would count that as fatherless. So the fact that half the, just over half the black kids in America don't live with their father doesn't mean they're fatherless. It's still a minority of black children who don't have their fathers somehow in their lives. Let me hang on one second. I have an applause here somewhere. I just want to play that. Because <laughs> that is absolutely one of the biggest um, lies that we've all bought yeah. into. I mean, yeah. black people, white people, this is a narrative that has been promulgated 
that is absolutely not true. Where, whereas when I did my video, I did it from an anecdotal perspective, but now evidence, hard numbers from the CDC show that black fathers are the most active. And even though um, we have a lot of kids that don't live with their dads, that does not necessarily mean that those dads are not active in those right. children's lives and help doing their job and carrying out carrying their responsibilities. Here's a question for you, Josh, and, and then I, I'll let you get to the rest of your day. Why do you think this narrative is so pervasive that black fathers, what, and you mentioned, you alluded a couple things in your book, but I just, off the top of your head, why is this narrative allowed to continue if it's not true? Yeah, the first and most important thing to understand is you got the double whammy of bigotry. Okay, so so there are all of these false images, as you and I discussed, about dads in general. People start with this presumption that dads aren't good fathers, that we're not involved, that we're incapable. So there's sexism in that against men and women. Okay, so that's across all races. Then you add from black dads, you add the racism. You know, and that's what Charles Blow was talking about in his New York Times op-ed about my book. But then you have to add the racism, and there's generations of racism ingrained in American culture against black men, I mean against black people, but also specifically against black men. And so this, this has, so there's that, but there's also to some extent um, these statistics being used out of context as scapegoating when there are you know, systemic problems that we need to talk about in this country. Um, these statistics can be used out of context to say, well, no, 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 the real problem place, facing the black community is that most black dads aren't there. Right. Um, I did this interview the other day with Michael Smirconish on the radio. He said, why, 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 why am I learning this from you, Josh Lebs? Why didn't I learn this from the NAACP? You know, why didn't I learn this from civil rights groups? And I said, often they don't know either. You know, th this, this image is so prevalent. But but all that said, I will also say that you know fatherlessness in America across all races is also a problem and something that needs to be addressed. Um, but it's it's in the case of this false this myth this false myth of black men, the biggest thing to understand is that we have to hit it from both perspectives. We've got to conquer that sexism and the racism that is creating this false narrative. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, the name of the book is All In, um, and the author is Josh Lebs, and I think it's definitely a read that everyone needs to get um, because it's a whole, it's a holistic look. It, it, you cover all the bases in here, even down to this last part, um, and then uh, the part about the, uh, the story that you gave of the young man who was going to um, child support court, and he couldn't pay simply because he was on chemotherapy. Um, yeah. And you give, you give the background on that. If, any thoughts on that as, as we get ready to go? Yeah, 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 no, this is good. I'll point out two things. So, so first of all, when it comes to um, custody and, and all these issues, um, or, or giving, you know, providing money, um, we are doing unconstitutional things in this country, it, unquestionably. It's, it's factually unconstitutional. Men and some women, but usually men, are being thrown in jail without being charged at all, simply because a woman fills out a piece of paper saying the man did not pass along child support money. It's, it's so obviously unconstitutional. They don't even get representation in some of these cases, and they'll sit there in jail for a while. And what we need to understand is the fact that you haven't paid child support, whether you're a man or a woman, doesn't mean that you're sitting on a pile of money. You might not have the money to pay. Now, you know, you know, all the good dads like you and me are ashamed of dads out there who have plenty of money and are refusing to, to provide child support. Those dads exist and those moms exist. But I say that this term deadbeat dad is another way of generalizing about dads, whereas really there are deadbeat moms too. So we should be saying, you know, deadbeat parents. And, and so th these problems exist as well. And um, can I tell you one more thing too? Absolutely. I, great. I just want people to know another thing I did in this book is I went to jail. And I spent time with dads in jail. Um, and so I'm able to report on the, the uh, firsthand with people's stories. First of all, the disproportionate effect that this incarceration crisis is having on black men and black fathers. And I get their backstories. Um, and also that there are reasons for hope on all these fronts. In the court level, there are reasons for hope. I can show you in the book that things we can do to make things better. And with this incarceration crisis, there are steps we can take, including there are programs now to help dads in jail build relationships with their own kids. That way when they get out of jail, they have someone that's waiting for them, family that's waiting for them, instead of just their fellow criminals waiting for them. So 
I, I am able to, to, you know, hit a lot of topics in here, and I'm just really passionate about this. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm joined by um, three panelists that I'm very happy to have here today. Um, let me just make a couple of adjustments here really quickly. Uh, I'm joined by Jesse Harriet, uh, Pastor Robbie Morganfield, and John Little, um, all of whom, um, well, actually, Jesse, this is your first time on the show with me, right? Yes, it is. I'm glad to be here, Ben. Absolutely glad to have you. Jesse is a spirituality scholar and, um, and a speaker. Um, he travels the country discussing um, um, and lecturing different uh, facets of, of human spirituality, um, and so I'm glad to have him here. Pastor Morganfield um, is a pastor, a PhD uh, scholar. Uh, he, he preaches and pastors and discusses uh, the intersection of faith and justice, um, and we also are joined by John Little. Um, he is an, a, an education advocate, a political strategist, and i um, just glad to have him back. He's been with us before. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, thanks for having me back, Ben. Excellent, excellent. All right, so let me let me just go in order here. Let's see, John. I have you up first, John. What are some of your thoughts about the of this book, the chapter on black fatherhood? Um, just just you you listen to the entire interview. What do you think? I did. It, to me, it was enlightening, and so I immediately got online and I started to realize a lot of those facts were true, and and it, and it was sad I didn't know. You know, I was like, I thought the same thing as you. Like, I appreciate Josh for bringing it out. But I was just, I wish we would have talked about this more uh, and would have actually been writing about it more. Yeah, a long, a long, a long time ago. Pastor, yeah. uh, Pastor Mark Morganfield, I mean, why, why do you think we have not heard about this uh, prior to this book? And particularly, why are we having to hear, from it, uh, hear about it from a, one of our white brothers when we have an entire legion of scholars who could have done, who could have gathered this research? Uh, well, I, th I think some part of it is um, ac access, perhaps, to the research, uh, understanding that such information is available. Uh, and listening to it myself this morning, I was going, wow, inside yeah. the whole time, because it's it's news to me. Absolutely. Jesse, um, you're a dad, right? Yes, I am. Yes, sir. Did you know any of these stats that he's throwing out? The fact, I mean, did you know them concretely? I think a lot of us knew them um, anecdotally, um, but for you, had you heard any of these stats before, and what are your thoughts about them? I've not really heard those stats before, um, but I knew them intuitively, like you hinted at earlier. And, it, I mean, everything he's saying, you know, I, they, they're definitely my experiences, you know, being a dad and then taking my daughter to the doctor and, you know, my wife being there and the doctor addressing my wife and I'm sitting right there and I know the issue, but then the doctor not even looking at me or having a conversation with me, you know, and then people joining the bandwagon and beating down dads as opposed to lifting them up. So everything he said was directly on point and I wish more people would know about it. And I'm glad for your show because now they will know about it. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the reason that, um, that I did the show. And actually, um, a good friend of mine, Kevin, sent over this clip um, that um, Josh did with the Smirconis show, Michael Smirconis, and they were discussing this. And as I was listening to it, I'm like, this is, <clears throat> this is my book. I mean, this is not my book, but this is my video in a nutshell. This is, this is what we knew um, on a, <clears throat> a, 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 intuitively. We, we could feel it. We could see it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and whenever we heard people talk about the missing black father, we were like, hey, no, wait a minute. Here we are. We're here and we're active. Uh, but I want to ask everyone this and, and anyone jump in. Um, first one up gets the mic. <laughs> what do you think? Do you how how hard is it for you to believe this information? Um, because it all goes counter to everything we've known or ever thought about black fathers. I can say something, brother. Go for it. Um, uh, I know that I, I believe the information to be true because I have conversations with black fathers in my family and black fathers that I meet every day. And listen, we're out there. We, we, we all are standing in the little girl's aisle. For those of us that have daughters, we're shopping for dresses. We're picking out shoes. Brother, we're doing hair. And we're not like that little YouTube video that's going around where you have the little girl who's spinning and doing a 360 and you do the magic bun. I, some of our daughter's hair texture ain't like that. So we got to actually comb that sucker and brush it and create styles. So we're doing it all, man, you know, and, and I believe that it's more, I hate to say that it's like an underground thing, you know, where no one knows about it. We all know about it, but statistically, we just need folks to acknowledge it. And I think that what he did with the book was he acknowledged what we already knew to be true. So he did the academic legwork, 
so to speak, so that the numbers would be there for the scholars so they wouldn't have nothing to say. Right. Because for too long, we've had this narrative just pushed down our throat that right. black men are not there, they're not capable, they're, they're savages, they're, they're running around, they're uh, just getting women pregnant, and, and we've bought into it so long that at this point it's hard for us to believe anything. I mean, it really is a cognitive dissonance. And I think that speaks to, um, um, I hate to use this phrase because it's, it's definitely overused, um, but it speaks to the power and the efficacy of white supremacy to be able to program our own minds to, to reject information um, and to accept negative information about ourselves and to reject positive information even when even when we see that it's true and, and I think I think um, that this information is going to be difficult for many black people to mm -hmm. swallow. I, I, I think it's going to be easier for other people to to, to accept this um, and we're gonna find a lot of black people and I, I as I did when I did my video um, a lot of people um, black people in particular were like well this is just not true this is bull this is expletive this, expletive that, um, you know, my daddy wasn't there. And I think what, what happens is, is when we get, uh, when we experience something, that's the manner through which we view everything. Right. If we had a bad dad, then we right. view every other black man as a, as a bad dad. And then, um, John, back to you, what you said, I think is very, very true that because of a season where Black men uh, were incarcerated. They were uh, strung out on drugs. Drugs were flooded in our community, and we were we we did have a lull. But I've seen this next generation come back with a vengeance. With like, I mean, when they, when it comes to being a dad, they come out with the vengeance. What are some of the things that you've seen? Yeah, uh, I would love to touch on that. And so, let's say historically there have always been policies that have targeted black men, you know, from slavery all the way up until the 70s and the 80s. And I think one thing that really killed the black family, if you look at it historically, was welfare reform, when it was a specific policy that if you were not married, you could not be in the house, or if you were receiving welfare benefits, that a man couldn't be in the house. And what would happen, and, and even for me, I'll be honest, when my son was first born, I was laid off and we were receiving welfare benefits and we had to say that I did not live in the house. And from there, if you look at the projects and you look at the housing projects, it, it really took us away from our traditional family and we're just now starting to build it back. Um, but it's a long time coming. Now, now that we know the truth, the truth should set us free. <laughs> and we should be able to run with this and let people know um, not only do we know this on a very personal level, but the statistics bear it out that uh, black fathers are not missing. Black fathers are present. Is there more work to do? Absolutely. But we've bought into it and we've contributed to this problem, this false narrative so much that even even our good old black president, uh, President Barack Obama, um, when he speaks uh, so many times when he speaks to the black community, he speaks with um, he speaks in a manner in which he's instructing and, and instructing and lecturing us about the missing black dad and, and, and how and how we have to help these single mothers out and, and all these types of things. And, you know, if I can just say my piece. I think it's time for leadership to come to the front that knows the truth, not only based on what's on the paper, but knows the truth personally. And what I'm saying is this, is that, um, for instance, I'm not picking on President Obama, but I think I will. I, I support him enough that I could pick on him with this. Um, I think his experiences without a father absolutely shaped his worldview with regard to black fathers. And I think that it's time for black leaders across the nation to come up who have had their fathers, because that's going to create an entirely different phenomenon where if the people, like you said, Pastor Morganfield, if, if people in media, our black media, our, our own media outlets, if they didn't have any experience with a good black father, they need to find some people who do, because if the truth says based on the numbers that black fathers are present, then we need men and women out there who are going to promote that message until 
everyone realizes that the average black father is an amazing person and that he's doing his job, not because, not because he's special, simply because that's what we do. Thanks for watching, everyone. For more information, you can check out the book by Josh Lebs. There's a link in the description. We definitely want to get the word out, particularly the information about uh, black fathers and how black fathers are doing best of all, of all races. And it's, it's great information that we need to get out. Um, also, subscribe to this channel, to the Your Black World channel. And for all news and information relevant to your black world, go to www.yourblackworld.net.